everybody. Y'all can say hello back. I'm sorry. <laughs> hello, and welcome to the second event in PEN America's Flashpoint series, Entangled Histories, Free Speech, and Civil Rights from the 1960s to Today. My name is Ashley M. Jones, and I am the co-director of PEN Birmingham. PEN America stands at the intersection of literature and human rights to protect free expression in the United States and worldwide. We are a 100-year-old organization that champions the freedom to write, recognizing the power of the word to transform the world. Penn Birmingham is a part of Penn America's Penn Across America program, which engages communities across the U.S. around free expression, and we are proud to serve Birmingham and Alabama at large. Our mission is to unite writers and their allies to celebrate creative expression and defend the liberties that make it possible. Our strength is our membership, a nationwide community of novelists, journalists, nonfiction writers, editors, poets, essayists, playwrights, publishers, translators, scholars, and other writing professionals, as well as devoted readers and supporters who join with them to carry out PEN America's mission. You can find out more about our events, advocacy efforts, and about joining PEN America at PEN.org. Tonight's event is the second in a year-long series presented by PEN America in partnership with the American Historical Association, made possible in part by a major grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Special thanks to our partners in Birmingham, the Birmingham Museum of Art, where we are right now, and the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. The historical flashpoints in this series highlight pivotal moments in which artists, activists, writers, filmmakers, and intellectuals tested the limits of free speech, challenging the public to redefine freedom and realize it anew for populations and causes that were at risk of having their liberties denied. The series is time to mark PEN America's 100th anniversary. In addition to the live events, digital resources will be available to educators and the public for years to come. You can follow Flashpoints as it moves across America. Still to come are events in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, and Tulsa. We will be uploading videos of all the events and providing educational materials related to the program's themes on our website. We are thrilled that you were all able to join us this evening for what I know will be an engaging and robust conversation about American democratic history. We are grateful to have here tonight our moderator, Dewana Thompson, and panelists, Carlos Ball, Dr. Tara White, and Michael Herod. I want to start us with a poem about perspective, about point of view. In America, even before the 1960s, we have been told that this country was built on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But all it takes is a little perspective and a little close reading or reading comprehension to understand that this has never been the case. All we have to do is look at history or even just look at the very documents folks claim to be such beacons of fairness and equality to see that many of us were never meant to be included in any of the freedoms outlined by the founding fathers. We have also been told that racism and oppression was born and will live on only in the Confederacy. But again, this has never been true. Although the South is seen as the only evildoer in our history of oppression, our whole country has always been complicit in upholding, maintaining, and benefiting from racism and its byproducts. This poem begins with a quote from Dr. King, which reads, the straitjackets of race prejudice and discrimination do not wear only Southern labels. The subtle psychological technique of the North has approached in its ugliness and victimization of the Negro, the outright terror and open brutality of the South. This poem is called, All Y'all Really From Alabama. <laughs> I love the laughs whenever I say that title, because <laughs> it's true. Everybody really is from Alabama. This here, the cradle of this here nation. Everywhere you look, roots run right back south. Every vein filled with red dirt. 
blood, cotton. We the dirty words you spit out your mouth. Mason Dixon is an imagined line. You can theorize it or wish it real, but it's the same old ghost, see-through, benign. All y'all from Alabama, we the wheel turning cotton to make the nation move. We the scapegoat in a land built from death. No longitude or latitude disproves the truth of founding father's sacred oath. We hold these truths like dark snuff in our jaw. Black oppression's not happenstance, it's law. And now I'll introduce our moderator, Dewana Thompson. Dewana L. Thompson is the current president and CEO of the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. She is a co-founder and principal with Think Rubik's, a global social innovation consultancy which helps nonprofits, businesses, and governments to engage in systems to harness the transformative power of culture. She is also the founder of Woke Vote, an organization designed to engage, mobilize, and turn out African American voters in the South through campus and faith-based outreach, strategic media outreach, culturally relevant GOTV efforts, and training for organizers. Notably, the program has engaged over 2 million black voters nationwide and has trained over 5,000 new leaders. Prior to Think Rubik's, Thompson served as a National Deputy Director for Community Engagement and the National African American Engagement Director for the Democratic National Committee. Before working at the DNC, Thompson was appointed by the Obama White House to serve as a senior advisor in the U.S. Small Business Administration. Thompson is a Dial Fellow with the prestigious Emerson Collective. She's appeared on MSNBC, CNN, in Essence Magazine, The New York Times, and The Washington Post, among others, as a thought leader on race, politics, and social engagement strategy. Welcome, Dewana, and our panelists. Thank you, Ashley. I didn't know they were going to give such a thorough bio, uh, but I certainly appreciate that. Uh, welcome this evening uh, to this very important conversation. I want to thank PEN America and PEN Birmingham for the opportunity. Um, I also want to acknowledge Graham, uh, my colleague in the fight here um, from the Birmingham Museum of Art. Graham, let me tell you, this air is working tonight. Uh, it's <laughs> So if you see, listen, you're right. Listen, it's, it's, it feel good up in here. So we going we need that because this is a, a hot topic, right? Um, and I, I just want to say that um, I'm not gonna speak much tonight because we have such um, powerful panelists in front of us. And I want to make sure that we get um, the, the meat of what they have come to share with us. What I will do uh, is situate us in their bios. And then once we do that, I will go directly to each one of them for um, their flashpoints and some conversation. And so we'll jump right in. We know that this event is to talk about free speech and um, the connection and intersection of civil rights. We understand that even as we sit here, that both of those things are under attack in this country. Uh, we understand that there are some who are for that and some that are against that. And I think what we are here to do is to commit ourselves to listen, um, to reckon with uh, the conversation and to reckon with the viewpoints and to consider as we go about our separate ways how we will then have these conversations once we leave this moment. And so I welcome you into this sacred space. I want, I want us to know that uh, every viewpoint, every flashpoint um, is viewed and received um, from a place of openness and learning. And so with that, I'm so excited to introduce uh, this distinguished panel. First, I would like to introduce Professor Collis Ball. He is a distinguished professor of law and Judge Frederick Lacey Scholar at Rutgers Law School. He is a nationally recognized expert on LGBTQ rights laws or rights law in constitutional law. He is the author or editor of nine books. His books include Principles Matter, The Constitution, Progressives, and the Trump Era, The Queering of Corporate America, and The First Amendment and LGBT Equality, A Contentious History. Please help me welcome Professor Carlos Ball. who I told uh, when we started this that all roads lead to Alabama, so thank you, Ashley, for, for that. Uh, we next have the distinguished Michael Harriet. 
He is a columnist at thegrio.com and The Guardian, where he covers the intersection of race, politics, and culture. He is a frequent political commentator on MSNBC and CNN, and has been honored by the National Association of Black Journalists for commentary, digital commentary, and TV news writing. Michael earned degrees in mass communications and history from Auburn University, we won't hold that against him, roll tide, and earned a master's degree <laughs> in microeconomics and international business from Florida State University. University. He also currently serves as a staff writer for the Amber Ruffin Show on Peacock. Please welcome Mr. Michael Harriet. <laughs> Last but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Tara Wright. She is an assistant professor of history at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, where she specializes in African American history and public history. She previously served as a lead history faculty and former chair. Um, as the lead history faculty and former chair of the Arts and Science Division at Wallace Community College in Selma, Alabama. Dr. White earned a PhD in public history from Middle Tennessee State University, a Master's of Art degree from the Cooperstown Graduate Program at SUNY Aniana, and a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Go Blazers. Y'all help me welcome Dr. Tara White. So as you can see, we got some smart people up in here tonight. And so with that, we want to start and give them an opportunity to really give um, some vision uh, and understanding from their different flashpoints. I'm going to start with you, Professor Ball. Um, you've written a lot about how the protection of free speech uh, rights have been essential to the promotion of equality rights uh, for racial minorities in the LGBT community in the US. Can you share um, more about the cases that promoted the free speech rights that led to civil rights movements or civil rights gains? I'd be happy to. Um, is this working? I think it is. Thank you so much uh, for um, the invitation to participate in this program. I'm absolutely thrilled uh, to be here with such an um, august group of, of speakers, scholars. Um, so thank you for including me. Uh, Penn and, and the other uh, organizers. Um, as the one I just said, I, 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 I want to talk and spend my few minutes um, with you all talking about five Supreme Court cases from the civil rights era that are cases that are ostensibly about free speech. Um, they were litigated under the First Amendment. But I want to try to persuade you in my nine and a half minutes that I have left that they're actually also about equality. Because I do believe that our history shows that without robust, American history shows, I should say, we, um, that without robust protections for free speech, we wouldn't have had the opportunity for equality that we've had over the last few decades. And I want to make it very clear at the beginning that my argument is not that free speech rights are uh, sufficient to guarantee equality. By no means uh, is that the case. But I do think that our history, at least the history in the second half of the 20th century, shows that they are important to promoting uh, equality. And I want to focus in particular on the civil rights movement uh, and this LGBTQ rights movement. So I want to talk about three cases uh, involving civil rights that were really free speech cases, but again, that had an impact uh, on uh, equality issues. And then I want to finish by talking about two cases involving LGBTQ uh, free speech decided, incredibly enough, in 1958 and in 1962 by the Supreme Court, right? Before we as a society were anywhere near a position to be discussing of issues related to sexual orientation. So the three cases that I want to speak to you about, two of them um, came out of Alabama, right? Um, one was NAACP versus Alabama, decided in 1958, just a handful of years after Brown versus Board uh, of Education. And what happened in the NAACP case was that state officials trying to intimidate, harass, silence the NAACP in the 1950s tried to force the organization to reveal the name of its members, both names and addresses. And as we know, to be a member of the NAACP in Alabama in the 1950s was to put one's life quite simply in danger and one's loved ones in danger. 
the state knew exactly what it was doing. The NAACP, of course, resisted the efforts and used the First Amendment, right, as the main legal argument to defend itself against the state because what the state wanted to do was to silence the organization. NAACP wins before the U.S. Supreme Court in 1958, and that case continues to be very important today because it was the first time that the U.S. Supreme Court held that the free speech clause protects a right to associate with others in the pursuit of common political and social objectives. Did that victory mean that all of the NAAC problems in Alabama went away the day the opinion came down? Of course not, right? The state continued in uh, its efforts to harass uh, the organization and its members, but there was a very powerful message, a unanimous message from the Supreme Court in 1958 holding that the First Amendment was in, on the side of civil rights and of the NAACP. Second case, also coming out of Alabama, probably the most famous of the cases that I'll be talking about uh, with you all, um, and that's New York Times versus Sullivan, right, which arises from Montgomery. Um, the head of public safety in Montgomery sues the New York Times for libel after the paper published a full-page ad taken out by a civil rights group, local civil rights group, that contained a handful of minor factual inaccuracies. Once again, right, in the same way that officials in the first case tried to use the law, right, to silence the NAACP, what the white racist defenders of segregation were after in the libel lawsuit was to try to intimidate the media into now not providing favorable coverage to the civil rights uh, movement. An incredibly important legal question is before the Supreme Court in this case um, in 1964. Alabama law at the time, once the libel lawsuit was filed, the burden was put on the newspaper to prove the truthfulness of everything that appeared in the, that was related to the lawsuit or be subject to libel liability. The Supreme Court understood that a free press could not operate in, in that type of legal environment, right? And what the court did in Sullivan was it, it said the First Amendment requires that the burden be placed on the public official who is suing for libel to prove either that the newspaper knew what it was publishing was false or at least that it acted with reckless disregard. Third very important free speech slash equality case was a case called Edwards versus South Carolina decided by the Supreme Court in 1963. Um, a group of 185, I think it was, black high school and college students were arrested on the grounds of the South Carolina State House for peacefully demonstrating against um, segregation. They are charged with a breach of the peace. They're charged criminally. And as we know from that um, ugly history of that time, it was white racists who time and time again engaged in violence and harassment, right? but it was black people that were time and time again arrested for peaceful protesting. The Supreme Court in 1963 overturned the convictions, saying that they violated the First Amendment. And, and so I believe my argument is that these cases contributed in crucial ways right, to progress on civil, in civil rights. And in fact, I don't think that we would have gotten the Civil Rights Act of 1964 when we did. We eventually, I would like to think, would have gotten the statute, but I don't believe we would have gotten it when we did uh, if it had not been for these types of judicial rulings that helped put pressure, political pressure, on Congress and on President Lyndon Johnson to enact and then to sign the legislation. So let me shift now and talk about the intersection of LGBT equality uh, and free speech. You know, the LGBTQ rights movements over the last few years, as we all know, has achieved some remarkable uh, uh, objectives, uh, uh, including, of course, in 2015, when the Supreme Court held that the Constitution recognizes the right of same-sex couples to marry, 
Just a couple of years ago, the Supreme Court also held that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, prohibits discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. These are the kinds of victories that we've seen for equality over the last few years. But what a lot of people don't realize is that those equality victories were built on top of free speech protections. Because for the most of the 20th century, LGBTQ people had absolutely no rights to equality and no rights to privacy under the Constitution. In fact, in 1986, I'm be dating here myself, but when I graduated from college, same year, the Supreme Court held that the government could put gays and lesbians in jail for engaging in consensual sex in the privacy of their home, right? Um, that's how bad things were in 1986. Um, so, so for most of the 20th century, no constitutional rights except for, except for free speech rights. And this is um, a part of constitutional history that I fear has been lost. That's one of the reasons why I want to talk to you about these two cases. Um, uh, because they were decided by the Supreme Court, one in 1958 and the other one in 1962. They're not famous, they're not like Brown, they're not like Sullivan, um, but they're incredibly important cases. First case, called One Incorporated versus Olison, decided by the court in 1958, arises from the fact that a handful of early gay rights activists in 1953 in Los Angeles published what in effect turns out to be the first gay magazine published in the United States. They publish poetry, they publish fiction, and they publish articles of interest to LGBTQ people, trying to present a positive narrative of LGBTQ lives in contrast, of course, to the, to the constantly negative portrayals uh, of them by the government, by the media, by organized religion, et cetera, et cetera. The US Post Office in 1954 deems the magazine legally obscene and there's a federal statute that allows the post office to refuse to distribute through the mails obscene materials. Why was it obscene, you may ask? Well, because they published a short story and a poem uh, that contained gay characters. And that was enough, according to the post office. The um, magazine uh, challenged the government's attempt to censor it took the case all the way to the US Supreme Court and the Supreme Court in 1958 said that the government could not prohibit the distribution of this magazine on the ground that um, the material there was legally obscene, that violated the free speech rights of the uh, people who ran the magazine. An obvious point uh, to us, right, in 2022, not so obvious in 1958. Four years later, the government comes back, the post office comes back, and targets um, a so-called gay erotica magazine. Now, um, I should say that this was a very tame magazine. Certainly by today's standards, there were pictures, it included pictures of men in underwear and bathing suits. No nudity. But once again, the government said, this is obscene. It wouldn't be obscene if, this was, if, if the audience for the magazines were heterosexuals, but because there are gay men that are being targeted here with the magazine, it's obscene, we're not going to distribute it. The Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. You can't use moral disapproval of the group in question under the First Amendment to deny them the opportunity uh, to uh, have their own magazines. Two minutes, did you say? One minute, okay. Um, um, so what did these two cases allow LGBTQ people to do? Those who were brave enough to be out of the closet, right, in the 1950s and 60s, because of course the vast majority of LGBTQ people back then, for completely understandable reasons, 
were in the closet, but this was an effort to, uh, to come out. So it allowed them, of course, to publish uh, and distribute their own books and magazines. It allowed them to form pro-equality organizations. It allowed them to meet in public places like gay bars and lesbian bars, right? Um, using the First Amendment against efforts by the government to shut those places down. And most importantly, like with the civil rights activists in the 50s and 60s, it gave them some legal breathing space to, to demonstrate, to organize, uh, and to agitate. Um, so I don't think that we would have had the gains that we have had over the last few decades without robust free speech protections. Have we gained enough on equality on either race or sexual orientation and gender identity? Obviously not. But would we be worse off without the First Amendment? I think that is, that is the case. Now, again, I want to I finish with what I started. I want to remind you that I'm not saying that free speech rights guarantee equality. Sometimes free speech rights undermine equality. That is absolutely correct. Um, uh, hate speech being an example of that. Under our constitutional law, a lot of hate speech is, is permitted. Um, and there's no question about that, that that undermines equality. But I think when we look at history, the, the amendment gives to equality, the amendment takes away from equality, uh, but overall, I think we have gained more than we have lost. I think I will end there. <laughs> you know, there was so much, you can clap for that. Uh, yes, absolutely. They've given me like an impossible task, so I can't even, we'll get back into that, Professor Paul. <laughs> I'm gonna move quickly to Professor White. Um, you've researched the relationship between court cases on the freedom of association and black women in protest. Um, can you elaborate on some important cases and how they paved the way for black women in protest specifically? What I can do, and I was very pleased to hear um, Professor Ball um, talk about um, New York Times versus Sullivan because uh, what I really believe was that um, you know we, we are in Birmingham and of course the famous um, uh, Martin Luther King's famous letter from a Birmingham jail right um, it's published in the newspaper and um, had it not been for Sol New York Times versus Sullivan you pro you probably would not have been he probably would not have been able to do that and make his case right in um in in the newspaper but that was um one big point i wanted to make but what i um what i what i've done and what i've been doing is um looking at african american women in birmingham in particular well starting in Birmingham, but women in Alabama. And what I see is that, you know, these women have been in the forefront of defending those rights um, of protest, those rights of free association, those rights of um, political organizing, right? And so um, what I see in what, or, or what I've seen in my research is um, people like um, um, Lucinda um, Brown Roby, who was um, a teacher and a principal here in Birmingham. She um, started out as a member of the NAACP. And in fact, when the NAACP was banned, um, leading to NAACP versus Alabama. Um, it was um, Roby and Fred Shuttlesworth. We, now, we all know Fred Shuttlesworth. Um, most of us don't know Lucinda Roby. But it was Roby and Fred Shuttlesworth who, was working, who were working with the NAACP together, both um, on the membership committee, um, when the, um, the, the um, sheriff shows up with the, um, um, with the paperwork actually enjoining them from or from from continuing to function, right? And Shuttlesworth is like, oh my God, what are we gonna do? And she's like, well, I mean, you just go start another organization. I mean, you know. And so he goes home, he prays about it a little bit, and that's exactly what he does. And it ends up he, you know, creates in June of 56, 1956, um, the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. And um, Lucinda Roby is the only woman on that founding board. Okay, she's the only woman um, founder of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. The, um, but she goes on 
in addition to, you know, having been um, really engaged in NAACP um, to continue to organize for um, the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights and continue to push this, um, this, this, this movement forward in Birmingham. And she's not by herself. She's, you know, joined by a whole lot of other women. You know, um, Mrs. Ruby Shuttlesworth. Um, people don't really get that Mr. Reverend Shuttlesworth's wife was also, you know, very much involved. And it wasn't just baking cookies and making dinner for people. Um, it was actually out working, right? Um, she was engaged with organizing. Um, she put herself at risk and her children at risk. And so, you know, um, she was another person, um, Mrs. Um, Lola H Haynes Hendricks. Uh, Lola Haynes Hendricks, who actually is the reason I'm doing this, but um, she was another woman who engaged in this work of, um, of, of pushing this, this movement forward in the city of Birmingham. But those women um, every week had to face the the power of the state as they went to their mass meetings on Monday. Um, it was the power of um, the Birmingham Police Department as a representative of the state, right? Um, they're recording their meetings and um, harassing them and taking down their tag numbers and whatever. Now, as a historian and researcher, I'm very grateful for that because all that information is available for me, right? <laughs> yes, great, great um, um, primary source material. But, you know, can you imagine what these people were going through at the time or, or endured at the time they were there? So they were um, pushing back against the state trying to interfere in their association um, there with the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. But Roby, even after the NAACP was banned, Roby herself continued to push the NAACP. And in fact, there was a letter sent to the national office um, by a cadet teacher because um, Mrs. Roby was a, she was a teacher, but she was also a principal of an elementary school. So she served us both. And she um, encouraged all the people to register to vote and to um, join the NAACP. Now, of course, you know, this is scary as hell in Birmingham in the 1960s. And the teacher, the, the, the young teacher sent she, somebody had brought, bought her a free membership and she sent the membership back to the NAACP with a letter. And so Mrs. Roby penned this wonderful letter saying, you know, well, I encourage all people to become a member. Um, I am um, not phased. Uh, we don't want any members, but as a very proud life member, I'm going to continue to encourage people to join the NAACP. And b because she understood the power of freedom of association. And she, you know, um, both with the NAACP and with the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights, and continued to promote um, both organizations as she um, continued to work for um, um, equal rights and equality in Birmingham. But finally, I just want to, you know, with these women and um, not just the women, but, you know, African-American men, African-American children, here was the, you know, pushback against um, their, the curtailment of their right to protest, right? Um, and to actually, because that is also a part of the, the First Amendment. When I teach the First Amendment, um, I make sure people understand that. And so every time people went out, um, decided to organize and protest, of course, um, they were harassed by the state apparatus that was the Birmingham Police Department, and they were um, um, summarily arrested. You know, King and, and those guys, um, they were told to not march on the day that he, he Shuttlesworth and Abernathy were um, picked up and arrested. And so you had, but, but, but black women were at the forefront. Um, as um, the youth leaders, she and Ruby Shuttlesworth, um, Lucinda Roby and Sh Ruby Shuttlesworth were the people um, actually working with, um, with SNCC with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, people like James Bevel and his wife, Diane Nash, um, people like um, James Orange, organizing these young people who eventually go out and protest in what we now know as Project C, um, what we 
now uh, recognized from those iconic photos of dogs and fire hoses, right, on African American children. Okay, and so th these women though are are int integrally involved in making this happen. You know, again, from actually working with the children to um, helping to plan it out. Um, Lola Hendricks worked with Aunt, with um, Andrew Young and knew um, every point from the center of town, uh, how long it took to get from every point in the center of town back to their headquarters. Because that their safety and their bodily, their body, bodily safety, you know, their, their physical safety depended on knowing how to get back and a lot of different ways of getting back there safely. And so, you know, you have these, these ordinary, this ordinary but extraordinary women, you know, women whose, li whose lives and livelihoods were threatened. Mrs. Roby, um, <laughs> famously, Mrs. Roby uh, um, basically threatened her, um, her, her uh, supervisor all the time. That was the story um, that they would tell her that she was going to lose her job from this civil rights organi organizing. And she said, honey, fire me. I want you to fire me, fire me today. Fire me. <laughs> she would threaten him. Fire me. <laughs> I will have a lawsuit as soon as, as soon as the ink is dry on the paper. And so... It was funny that she actually got promoted during the movement, right? I, I think they were hoping that she'd be too busy to, to do this, and, and no, it did not happen. But, um, you know, I just wanted to, I want to make the point that um, in this sea of people who are on the ground, who are foot, who were on the ground, who were foot soldiers and engaged in making um, a more um, equitable and just society in Birmingham, Alabama, and across the state of Alabama. African American women were front and center, and these women are um, women that we, unfortunately, we do not know, but women we should know. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. White. Um, I can't wait till we get to the conversation part of this, but we're gonna move right ahead. Um, Michael, you've said that any discussion of free speech um, in the context of human and civil rights must begin with the acknowledgement that for black people, the First Amendment only exists in theory. Can you discuss times in American history when the First Amendment has been weaponized and used as a loophole to prevent black liberation? Yeah, so speech uh you know we have to realize like the bill of rights itself right each one of those 10 amendments to the constitution or like bricks right like you can use it to build a foundation of a country or you can throw it at somebody and hit them in the head right so oftentimes in america we never got to use that foundation we were the people who got hit in the head and a lot of times it was the civil, it was the First Amendment that was that brick, right? So, you know, one of the things I loved about living in Alabama, especially Birmingham, was like this, like, you know, I'm known a little bit for telling people about history, but in Birmingham, right, it's that history is living, right? I don't have to tell them, like, you, if you're from Birmingham, you'd be surprised how little of this history that people know, like, you know, just like she said, like when it, she said, everyone knows Fred Shuttlesworth, Shuttlesworth, right? Like, no, everybody doesn't know Fred Shuttlesworth, right? Most people in America don't know Fred Shuttlesworth, right? So, you know, Fred Shuttlesworth, you know, most of the bodily injuries that he should sustain through his lifetime was because of the First Amendment. The Klan existed because they were protected by the First Amendment, right? This, the, the anti-integrationists or the segregationists, they were protected by the, seg by the First Amendment. And the protesters, the civil rights protesters weren't, right? So there's a story that, I, it's weird that it's never told, right? So 
you know, back in the early 60s, we know that the FBI surveilled every black movement that ever existed, right? So one of the things that they did was they enlisted, they had an undercover agent working inside the Klan. That undercover agent, Gary T. Rowe, was present when the Ku Klux Klan killed Victor, Viola Luizzo in Selma. Well, Lowndes County, you're right, Lowndes County, right? They were doing that, they're doing that march. That, F, that undercover agent hired and paid by the FBI was present when Bull Connor let, gave the Ku Klux Klan 15 minutes with the Freedom Riders to do whatever they want, right? That FBI agent was knew about the plot to bomb 16th Street Baptist Church, and he was inserted in the Klan because the Klan was protected by the First Amendment. So they had monitored this movement of the Klan and protected it to the detriment of people who were asserting their rights to free speech, the right to protest, the right to organize, the right to associate with each other. But, you know, most of America don't, doesn't even know. Like, essentially, you know, we can couch it in all kinds of ways, but, you know, if the police are against the NAACP, then it is illegal to be in the NAACP, right? And that is protected by the First Amendment, and all of these, you know, noble Supreme Court cases that, you know, theoretically outlaw these activities, you know, like Birmingham schools didn't see segregation in, in 1954, right? Like, that's why they, like, you know, most people in America don't know, like, they know about 16th Street Baptist Church, but they don't know about the 49 other bombings Right? They don't know that a place called Dynamite Hill even exists. They don't know that you know, one of those bombs was placed in front of the hotel room that Martin Luther King was staying in, right? at the A.G. Gaston Hotel. And all of that was protected by the First Amendment. So you know, to, and, and this is not a criticism of the idea of free speech or the First Amendment, but it, it comes with the realization that these theoretical ideas only exist for some people, right? And so when you think about history, when you think about the civil rights movement, you have to realize like, that at some point, regardless of this pristine list of laws that were created to protect American freedoms, at some point, we have to realize like, there's such a thing as right or wrong, right? Like, you can write the Ten Commandments, but at some point, a crowd is going to gather and throw rocks at the person because the Bible said, Don't, you, thou shalt not commit adultery, right? Because it is a brick, too. It is not just a, a wall of protection. So when we think about when I think about it, right, so... Like the, oh, I've covered Ferguson, I've covered protests in Baltimore, I've covered the Charleston shooting. The only time I've ever been arrested at a protest was in Birmingham. <laughs> right? Like, and it, the last time was because the Klan was supposedly coming to march in Birmingham. The first and and the the first time was like in 2015, right? I had just come from New York, and I was dog tired to co from covering right after the death of uh, Eric Gardner. And I came to Birmingham, and a friend of mine told me that there was going to be a protest in Birmingham, right outside of the summit on 280. And I went there, and there were a lot of protesters. I got there early, right? So I had the time wrong, so I just parked my car in the parking deck right on the top so I could see because I didn't know where they were going to protest. And right next to my car, he didn't see me in there, was a police officer, and he was watching over the, the balcony of the protest, and he was talking to someone on the phone. 
And he said, those assholes aren't going to come. And it kind of angered me a little bit. But when the people did come, and the plan was they were going, it was a great plan. They were going to block traffic to the biggest shopping area in this city where the two interstates meet during the biggest sales day of the year, right? Like this was right before Christmas, the biggest uh, retail shopping day of the year. So it was a great purpose. It would definitely make people notice police brutality. And the people came and they gathered on the side of the curb, but no one stepped off of the curb. The police were there, they had buses ready to take protesters, and no one stepped off the, of the curb. And I was like, well, maybe they're waiting for the first person to step off. And I remembered what that cop said. <laughs> Those assholes aren't going to do anything. And I stepped off the curb, and those two police officers bent over me and they you know, began talking and people couldn't hear what they were saying. Everybody was chanting and they were telling me that they were going to take me to jail. And that is because I didn't have the First, the first Amendment available to me. They were protected by the First Amendment, but those protesters weren't. The cops who kill black people for no reason are protected by that bill of rights, but not the black people they shoot. So we have to understand that all of these court cases doesn't, don't mean anything in reality if the person has a gun and a badge and can do whatever they want. I want to, yes, please. I, um, I'm triggered in so many ways from all three of your conversations, having been gassed in Minneapolis and having worked with people like Miss Paulette Roby, um, who are still advocating and knowing that there is certainly, um, Professor Bell, something to be said about how freedom of speech shows up for some and not for others. Um, and I think this is a great time to bring you all into the conversation. Um, one of the things I was noting is that this is supposed to be a conversation about from the 1960s to now. And I know that both you, Professor um, Ball, and you, Dr. White, you sort of talked history, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to sort of bring some of your context into the current, um, the current moments that we're in. Um, I know that we've, we've heard a little bit of that from Michael. Two things I think that would be great to start off this part of our conversation is one, I'm wondering how you all feel about, um, Michael, you talked a lot about the fact that the, the um, Voting Rights Act of 1964 and some other things you know, that we're excited about, even in 2015 when um, same-sex marriage was granted. But as we sit here now in 2022, there's been a historic and direct attack on both the Voting Rights Act, it's been a historic direct attack on so many civil rights and civil liberties. So how are you feeling right now, how are we feeling right now <laughs> about, um, you know, in, about those bills or those amendments, those things that we thought were in place to help that. And I would also segue to say um, the leaders that um, utilize free, free speech to influence public opinion, how are we seeing that happening right now? And anyone can jump into, but I just wanted to give Carlos an opportunity. I should come on. Okay. So uh, I agree with everything that Michael said, which might surprise you given, given my talk, right? I mean, we are an incredibly unequal society, and we have been from the very beginning. And so it's, it's of course, you know, the way in which the First Amendment is enforced uh, has been horrific absolutely horrific in many, many different times in our history. I, that, I think that is, I, I think, you know, Michael put it so eloquently, I won't, I won't try to, um, uh, um, I, won't, I won't try to, quote, unquote, compete with him on that. Um, so, um, 
it the what gives me a glimmer of hope, however, right, including in these incredibly challenging times on so many different issues, right, is that and a lot of it a lot of it is theoretical, but you know, sometimes sometimes the theory does spill into the practical. And, you know, here we are having this conversation, right? Um, about free speech and about equality, raising a lot of different um, uh, issues, which we probably wouldn't be able to have if there weren't some protections uh, under the First Amendment. And and so um, I think I think we have to keep that in mind. Um, so anyway. You know, when I um, heard, actually I expected Michael to go there after, but, but you ended talking about how both sides are uh, protected by, um, by the First Amendment. Um, but I also heard, um, and, and this, I know we're, we're talking First Amendment, but you know, in all of that, 14th Amendment, and I'm not the law person, I'm just a historian, um, you know, the, the, the notion of equal protection, you know, and, and, and the framers of the 14th Amendment really understood this. The notion of equal protection before the law and equal protection under the law, right? That the law equally applies to everyone and that people are um, protected by the law, right? That is really what's at, at at play, and that is something like I said that you know um, the people who were um, creating the Fourteenth Amendment for during Reconstruction, the thing that they saw happening that African Americans would not have the same um, protections by the law. The law would not protect us the same, and that the law would not be applied to us the same. And if there's a common thread there, that is the thread that it does not. Um, and we've seen time and time and time again over the course of history, even into the present day, that, you know, that, that is um, one thing that um, is a scourge on American um, jurisprudence. So that's number one. Number two, you know, um, I have to on, only think about when we talk about present day and voting rights, you know, it was not... <laughs> I, as a, as a civil rights historian, as a person who studies Alabama, it did not surprise me that Shelby County versus, um, Shelby County versus Holder came from Alabama, and I'm from Montgomery. It did not surprise me that it came from Shelby County. Um, and so, yeah, and I said that with my whole chest. Uh, and so, <laughs> yes. And so um, I, I really wasn't shocked by that. I was extremely disappointed, but not shocked. But I also was not disappointed by the way African-American women showed up. African-American women showed up time and time and time again to, uh, to, to, to get people out to vote, um, to make sure that democracy worked, um, time and time and time again to, to continue to make sure that African Americans and, and, and Americans in general, right, had a say in their democracy. And so you continue to see these women get out front. Um, you know, the, the, we only have to look at, we're in Birmingham, we only have to look at the Doug Jones election. Hell, that was us. And I was still in Alabama at that time. That was us, you know. And so we continue to, you know, show up. And, and black women have done this from the time, from, from the time they, they had a voice. Um, they've been doing this. There's a, there's a historical loop. There's a historical line going from people like Maria Stewart all the way to the 21st century of black women showing up, right? And continuing to make, um, to, continuing to push for us to have a different society. So um, I'm, not, um, I'm not in the least, um, uh, you know, I, I, we're, we're gonna continue to show up because that's all we know to do, right? Um, that's all we know to do. As, as, um, as, as you know, Anna Julia 
Cooper said, when and where we enter, you know, the whole of our race enters with us, right? And, you know, we have the double strike of gender and sex, right? And uh, of, of, of gender and race, sex and race. And so we have to show up because Kimberly Crenshaw really is right about the whole notion of intersectionality, that there is a double, um, there is a double impact and, and a magnified impact um, in the justice system and everywhere else for black women. I see you leaning in, Michael. Yeah, yeah I was just, you know, going to echo what she said. We have to remember, really, like, if you want to, like, probably the person most responsible for the Voting Rights Act is Amelia Boyd, yeah. right? Like, when everybody else was scared, because, like, you know they said we can't do this, and you know they said we can't really vote. And she was like, but we're going like, to gonna do it. And she didn't point to a specific thing. She was like, oh, this is the right thing. Right. Like not like forget these little step stools or these little arcane rules. Like we are going to just go, we could just go show up, march over there and vote. We just go march over to Montgomery and get the governor a piece of our mind. We just go march over and get Jimmy Jackson out of jail because it's right. Right. Like we can point to these little, you know, but we know that stuff don't work for us, but we're going to force them to do what's right, and that's kind of, like, she's right, like, that's what black women have done to push the civil rights movement forward. You have to, you know, you have to remember, you know, all of those, all the civil rights leaders that, whose names we know, like, behind them were like, you know, the, the black women were behind the scenes, giving them the details of how to do this, making the plans. And in front of the scenes, but right. the media, were, right. the media right. would not talk to us. Right, because they assumed that the leader was always the guy. Yeah, well, so, I mean, and then we have to also realize, like, you know, the uncomfortable truth about the civil rights movement is that, like, many of the civil rights leaders were also, you know, had misogynistic and, and sexist tendencies patriarchal. that wouldn't have allowed women to be upfront. But, but that's not necessarily. And I will say, you know, I had to challenge that with um, Birmingham. You know, what was beautiful about. Um, People say a lot of different stuff about Reverend Shuttlesworth. Um, I, I'm a fan. Yeah, right. And I'm a fan because um, the executive board of the Alabama Christian Mu Movement for Human Rights had a whole bunch of women. You know, um, you had women, <laughs> you had women guarding Reverend Shuttlesworth's house after it was bombed. Mrs. Um, Minnie Eaton and Desta Brooks would, would get off, she would, Desta Brooks actually had a flower shop on Graymont. She would close her flower shop, and Minnie Eaton would get off her, her factory job, and they'd go there strapped and loaded, and yeah, locked and loaded, baby, with coffee, and they would stand, stand in that guard shack, and they would guard Reverend Shuttlesworth's house, and they were daring somebody to move. You know, um, they were there, he, and, and he talked about that. And, you know, I, I called and I interviewed him, and now I didn't get the same response from other right. ministers, you know. But, but no, they, there are people who do acknowledge their presence. Um, in Selma, in addition to Amelia Boynton, you had um, Marie Foster and um, Margaret um, Moore, who also were on the front lines with her, right? Um, both in the Dallas County Voters League and then, um, in, in, and then uh, well, actually both in the NAACP and then the Dallas County Voters League. And, and so they were pushing the, the thing forward. I think the history is so rich. So it, it's when you're having a conversation about freedom of speech and, and, and tying it to civil rights, then you actually have to go into the conversation of civil rights, right? And so what I want to do is we are going to open it up um, to, the, to the audience to ask a few questions. I want to center us back a little bit on the idea or the question around how has fr the First Amendment been invoked um, or you know, to help or hinder the progress of civil rights. And as we think through that, um, the next, I'll let you all, anyone who wants to respond to that, answer that, and then we'll open it up for Q and A Q&A um, for a few minutes. But just are there specific examples as to how um, 
and I would say even currently, just helped or hindered the progress of civil rights. One of the things I know, for instance, is the notion of the actual verbiage, right? So like things like black power, what did that do to shift public discourse or labor rights or you know any of the, the, the trigger words that we hear, you know, black lives matter or you know anything, how does that show up you know, as we relate to the conversations of how First Amendment um, has helped to invoke, uh, to help and hinder the progress of civil rights? Sorry, Carlos lost his mic. <laughs> Professor, uh, I think I think for for me it's it's about the way that I think about this is about reducing the size of the state, right? And in in the context of of civil rights, of race, in a city like Birmingham, the state was everywhere, and it was frightening, right? And so there was absolutely no space uh, as a practical matter, right, for individuals, for groups uh, who were opposed to the state to uh, represent themselves publicly in a way that was politically recognizable, right, um, um, and, and so, and so you, we can ask ourselves, what is it that 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 allowed some of that space to be created? And I do think, right, that enforceable, equally enforceable, free speech rights can help create that space. Um, in the context of LGBTQ issues, it was a matter of permitting individuals sexual and gender minorities to define themselves, right? Because the state, the media, organized religion, those who had access to the means of communication were the only ones who were speaking on these issues, right? And it was when that space was created slowly, gradually, with a lot of people getting physically hurt by the police, uh, because they were not presenting their gender, for example, in ways that were socially acceptable. Um, so that's the way that I think about it, right? It's, it's creating that space. Sometimes it's just a little sliver. Um, sometimes it's more. Sometimes it's hundreds of thousands of Black Lives Matter protesters on the street, right? Um, anyway. I think that's smart. Go ahead. Just one point that I'd like to make. Is you want to go ahead and find the first person? Uh, go ahead, Mike. That there is a danger of kind of disentangling the state from the people who they wield the power from. It was like the police wanted to, you know, suppress black people and everybody else was cool with it. They, the, you know, the state was an apparatus, I mean, let's be face, let's be honest, of white people, right? Like, you know, in a state that is, you know, about 30% black, you know, they were suppressed by the large minority of white people in America. Because if, if there would have been an outcry in Alabama or in Birmingham about this kind of abuse, from the vast majority of white people, it wouldn't have happened, right? So we can't, like, it's not really the state, like the state is just a brick, but somebody's hand is throwing it, right? And then the other thing I just want to say is, like, it's a, there's also a danger of kind of separating out the movement for black liberation from the rest of the civil rights movement, because we have to remember, like, if everybody would have been on board with the civil rights movement, there wouldn't have had to be a feminist movement and a LGBTQ movement. Remember A. Philip Randolph, who proposed the March on Washington in, the in 1941, had a platform of that, that any adult who has consensual sex, you sh he shouldn't be vilified. In 1940s, it was all one movement for the liberation of Americans and because black people were at the forefront of that and because black people and, and black oppression was the most noticeable part of that, the term civil rights has been condensed as something that is for black people. Black people weren't just fighting for themselves, they were fighting for 
all people's liberation. I remember when I was at Auburn, which, you know, y'all can denigrate, <laughs> right? Right? Like, I remember when they formed the LGB alliance. Like, this was just LGB back there. And they had a protest, and I was, and I was in the Black Student Union. I was like, you know we got to go out there and protest with them. And it was like, why? And I was like, because you know, we in the Black Student Union at Auburn. If they can shut down the LGB alliance, what you, who you think they going to, I mean, you know, they, that this ain't this no two different fights, bro. It's the same fight. And so we have to remember not to disentangle those two things. And remember that it is a movement for human rights and human liberation. Yeah, that's what that's my offer. Well, as you've begun to digest what you've been hearing, are there any questions for our panelists? I see one right here. Great. My, my question pertains to the limits of free speech. Um, you know, I, I, I make my donation to the ACLU every year, but the more, I, the more I'm on the internet, the more afraid I get about how much hate is hiding behind anonymity. Well, I make the mistake of reading the comment sections and articles, which they say never do, but there's so many you know, racists hiding, hiding behind the veil of anonymity online. Is the fighting word standard still enough, or do we need to have greater restrictions on speech with, with respect to hate speech like they do in Germany in the wake of the atrocity of the Holocaust? That might be a question for the law professor. <laughs> I have a building on, on Michael's distinction between the theoretical and the practical. Um, I have a, a theoretical and, and then practical answer to your question. The theoretical uh, answer is that, as a general matter, in theory, we're supposed to prohibit that speech which injures, right? And that's why um, the First Amendment, traditionally, the doctrine has recognized certain exceptions onto what's protected speech. So uh, uh, speech that defames or libels somebody. Um, uh, speech that in the commercial context is fraudulent, right, is not protected because it injures. Um, the Supreme Court has um, generally protected hate speech in this country, but I think it has done so in a, on, a, on the erroneous ground that it doesn't really injure in the same way, right? That words don't really harm me, I think is uh, a very privileged understanding of the role of language and speech. And so from a theoretical perspective, I think Germany and most European countries do it better than we do. What scares the bejesus out of me is the enforcement of hate speech regulations, right? Who is going to do the enforcement? Who is going to decide when that speech crosses the line and becomes injurious? And we're seeing this now uh, throughout the country, state legislatures enacting laws prohibiting, for example, teachers from saying anything that might make their white students uncomfortable in their classroom, anything related to the history of race, right? Right, and so, right, and so, and so when I see that, right, I wanna, I wanna go running to the hill and I wanna say, okay, I, I, I'm very, very nervous about the enforcement of hate speech regulations as a practical matter. I, I just like to add that, like, you know, it, it is because we have this very definite, narrow definition of hate and racism that it, you know, involves some kind of enforceable action. Like, if I am not yelling the N word in your face or preventing you from being hired intentionally, right? you know, it has something to do with intent and malice, then it is not violent, right? So 
you know, one of the things I always point out is because of the internet, there is a guy right now somewhere in a rural town who has a, who has Wi-Fi, and he has this hate in his heart for people who don't look like him. But because he can connect to other people and see that they have that same malice that would have in his town or in his families might have been suppressed because he knows that it is a bad thing. But when he can see that there are millions of other people who think like I do, because I can see that they're that they think this way on the internet or on the Joe Rogan podcast or something like that, then that emboldens them to take to go from their speech and their thoughts to their actions. And you know, even with that little specific example, think of all the people who have that kind of feeling against, for instance, trans people. Mm -hmm. Now, right, when they can see their representative and the people in Congress mm -hmm. defaming people and like, literally making rules to tell children that these people do not exist. Right. And if you say that they exist, there is something wrong with you so much that we are going to make it illegal, right? So, you know, it's hard to call that hate speech, but that speech is a form of violence mm -hmm. against people that's, you know, that has to be regulated somehow. Now, maybe it's up to the public to, you know, have some kind of democratic movement that shuts down that. But, to call, you know, it's, it's inadequate to call it hate speech as much as it is. As it is. It's really violence. Mm -hmm. Our next, next question here. Y'all can clap for that. I heard that coming. I'm going to take this question from... Hi, thank you so much. And thank you all for sharing your thoughts with us. This has been really rewarding. Um, my question is actually kind of segued by the, the answer that you just provided. Um, because I am I'm black and I'm a woman and I'm queer identified and I'm from the South and religious, I understand those intersections um, that you were speaking of earlier and how we have some people that are, they have left legendary legacies that have helped us in the movement for you know civil rights and social justice. But some people remember them differently because of how they feel um, living in the intersections that they live in. And so my question to the panel really is in this digital culture where um, you know we have a, a cancel culture in society and like you said we all have the internet and um, you've talked about how we are policing free speech you know overseas maybe better than we are here. So my question really is do you think that this cancel culture is advancing or hindering the progress of equality Quality in the First Amendment. What, what do you define? How do you define cancel culture? Uh, right. Well, um, the most you know recent. Um, uh, instance that I can think of is sort of in relation to what Dr. White was saying that some people believe that Fred Shuttlesworth was a hero and some people can only remember the rumors of him possibly having been homophobic um, and that's true of a lot of people in the in the leaders in the civil rights movement because of how Baird Rustin was treated um, and the like and so um, as we jump forward to 2022 the idea to me of canceling their legacy because of you know, the intersections which someone lives in, of course, we all are entitled to our opinion, but I wonder that this cancel culture isn't hurting the equality of the First Amendment, um, considering, as you just pointed out, it's not equal even today. Well, I guess you would have to give some examples of someone who was canceled, because, like, Fred Shuttlesworth wasn't embraced from he has, this he's certainly like, not been. And in some instances, I believe what we call cancel culture is people's right to react to something that they disagree with, which is free speech, right? Like, so if you say something that I don't like, you don't have the right to say what you say is protected, but my reaction to it is outlawed or discriminatory against you for saying the thing. We both have the right to air our opinion and our feelings, and so I don't kind of believe in cancel culture, because I can't, like, nobody ever gives an example of anybody who's canceled, right? Or, or people participating in the capitalist enterprise, right. right? Because, I mean, that's really what we're talking about. 
we're talking about um, economic reprisal as a result of people, you know, feeling um, or, or saying something that people didn't like and so they stopped shopping with them or they stopped um, viewing the show or whatever like that, or right? Or, well, 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 that wasn't council culture. Hell, that was just, you know, they just should, should have stopped. Yeah. But, um, but, but, but I will say that, you know, in this, in this free market society, we do have, you know, people do have those rights. Um, they do have the right to, you know, shop with whomever they want to and whatever. At the same time, though, and I was thinking about, you know, all the little people in these small towns who are now able to link up and, and be with um, um, all the haters and, and, and bigots that they want to be with, right? You know, bigot love fest. Um, the thing that is <laughs> most concerning to me about the internet as a vehicle for bigot love fest is that this would have been um, like you said this would have been just one person you know now it's a whole lot of people but the other part of that is that we now live in a society right and the, and the culture has shifted to a place where well I'm free to be a bigot I'm a bigot you know, it was, what's that Dr. Pepper song? I'm a pepper, you're a pepper, we're a pepper, he's a pepper, wouldn't you like to be a pepper too, right? And so I'm a bigot, you're a bigot, we're a bigot. I mean, you know, wouldn't you like, so, it, you know, it's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. And, and, and I think that's part of really what's the, what the danger is here for the First Amendment, right? Because we assume that words don't hurt. Right when words do, because it's words that led that young man to go to Buffalo to drive from upstate to now. I I know the landscape. I've driven across upstate New York a whole bunch of times, and so he drove a long way to go to kill those people, right? But it's words that actually propelled him to do that and so when people understand that those words that you're constantly speaking you know it, it's motivating these people to commit such heinous crimes and heinous um, attacks against other folks then you know you know we, 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 we need to start asking other questions we need to start asking other questions but we also need to start need to really pay attention to normalizing hate because it really is being normalized. I have friends, um, of course, as an uh, African-American woman, you know, I, th this, as a historian, this is a really interesting time to exist. And I see parallels between, and I'm gonna say this, you know, a friend of mine had been saying, damn, this feels like reconstruction and post-reconstruction all over again, right? Post-reconstruction was scary as hell. Seriously, um, Col I can even, uh, we can call up things, Colfax Massacre yeah. in Louisiana, where they just went to the polling place and, and, and gunned down a whole bunch of African Americans because they were, going to they, they were going to vote, right? What's to prevent something like that, right? I, I feel an atmosphere. This at that atmosphere, that, yeah, that atmosphere exists now, uh, right? Really and so... I, I, I think it's time for us to, to start really thinking, you know, and, and really folks who don't feel this way, you know, most of the time we just, you know, folks sit back and they're like, no, well, people aren't going to really, no, you, you're going to have to become more vocal. Now, as you can see, I'm, I'm pretty vocal anyways. I've always been that way. But we're going to have to become more vocal and say no to normalizing this hate and, and people being um, 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 verbal or, or being able to be out. Well, I should have the freedom to say, yes, you have the freedom to say whatever you want to say, but I'm going to still call it hate. Thank you so much. <laughs> I don't know why Pan America gave us an hour and a half like this, like we could wrap our arms around all of this in that amount of time, but can you please help me to celebrate these incredible panelists? Um, tonight, you have shared with us 
As Ashley joins us back on the stage, I do want to give them a second to do a, a 30 second wrap up for each one of you. I do want to say that bigotry doesn't just exist in rural areas. That we have bigots right here in the city of Birmingham, right in, right in major places. So don't, let's not relegate bigotry to, to a region. But I also just want to remind us that Conversations like this, you know, help to move us forward. And so as the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute partners like the Birmingham Museum of Art um, with PEN America, it is our hope that we create safe spaces, sacred spaces to have these courageous conversations, which I believe that we have had tonight. Do y'all feel that we've had a good, courageous conversation tonight? <laughs> Great. And so with that, I will start with... Um, uh, Professor Carlos, and, and uh, let him give us a 30 second wrap up and we'll move on down the line and we'll give it to you, Ash. So my 30 second wrap up um, is even though I have been, I emphasized during my remarks, uh, the law, lawsuits, the Supreme Court, um, the First Amendment, et cetera, um, at the end of the day, uh, the courts are not going to solve our problems. The law is not going to guarantee equality. Um, it's in our hands. We are the ones who have the power to uh, try to make that change. Um, and that's what I would hope, you know, one of the things that we can take from our conversation uh, this evening. It's been such an honor to be uh, part of this conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah, my 30 second wrap up is, like, I always like to remind people that you are society you are the law. This kind of hate, this kind of bigotry, the things that we are fighting for, is not something that society can do if you don't allow it in your presence. And it is up to you individually to fight the person next to you that perpetuates any kind of discrimination. Because what we have to realize is that we are all living in a country filled with people who are all individually different. And it is up to us to give those people the rights that we all deserve. My 30 second wrap up is this. Um, we live in a society that is um, increasingly um, diametrically opposed. Um, there are just so many things in so many places where um, we, you know, just kind of seem to be breaking apart in the seam, at, the, at the seams. But what I will say is that, you know, I, I was really serious about this feeling like post reconstruction and um, all of the rights that have been gained over a course of 150 years um, are being rolled back. The urgency is now, it's not tomorrow, it's not next week. It's not next month, next year. The urgency is now. Now is the time to do it. Now is the time to move. Thank you. Well, in the words of Asada Shakur, it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love each other. We must support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Thank you. That was really, really awesome. Uh, thank you all for attending tonight's event. And special thanks again to the American Historical Association, Birmingham Museum of Art, Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. And a special thanks to our panelists for their fascinating insights into civil rights and free speech in America. I think I'm not alone when I say I wish I could just sit and listen to y'all for like many hours. So <laughs> thank you so much. Before you leave for the evening, I invite anyone who would like to provide a testimonial for us about this evening's program to please find Kristen and Sabrina on your way out to offer an audio or video testimonial of tonight's event. We would love to know, how did this panel affect how you feel about free speech and civil rights in the US today? I want to end with a poem that seeks to explain the very simple idea that things aren't equitable for black people and many others in America and never have been. It is an acrostic poem which uses a very controversial theory, which we did hear today. I'm a public school teacher, so I'm not gonna say theory, but y'all heard the theory uh, name. <laughs> um, it uses that theory as its guiding letters. 
I'll sign them in American Sign Language as I read. What it really is. Coastline broke into forest, into village. Seas rolled in uninterrupted waves. Somewhere, I insisted on being born. Somewhere, countless tribes called each other by name. Somewhere, a black panther inches ever closer to its prey. Somewhere, the sun is a halo. Cameroon is a whisper in my blood. The ancestry kit tells me as it uses DNA to glue me back together. Can it catch long strands of lineage shucked and punched to pulp? Somewhere, a clot rubs its rigid way into my veins. It calls itself America. And the seas were parted with my body over and over. Centuries are cut into the skin and stretched across my womb. Will every lifted voice be silenced? When does a theory become a threat? I return to the coastline, village, bright arc, halo of sun. All this has been bloodied, even my body a wound infinitely. Earth spins on an unfair axis, streets curdle, again blood. Oh, come back coastline, come back unshipped sea. Remember the way my people were robbed of bone and breath? You called it liberty. Thank you and good night.